Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you guys are keeping well, wherever you're dialing from. Thank you very much for taking the time out to join us tonight. Really appreciate you being here. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Teshin Khan to the Morocco platform for the first time. Welcome, Teshin. Teshin will be delivering his presentation on claiming R&D tax relief for your clients, our clients out there who are actually desperately needing this um, tax relief. Teshin is an R&D tax consultant at Growth Part and is also a tax author with three tax books published through Indicator FL Memo including a book about R&D tax relief. Wow, I need to get some. Yeah, I need to get some of those books, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we want signed copies. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Growth Pad was founded in 2017 to address the disconnect between R&D tax consultancies and accountants. Teshin has worked in tax for 12 years with the experience of working for the largest accountancy firms in the UK, including three years in Canary Wharf. Without further ado, uh, welcome you to, to um, uh, the stage. Tessin, you've got a wonderful, wonderful team of guys here. Yes, well behaved. What we do best is we mute and we allow you to speak. And then we on all your mute when you ask us questions. So feel free to ask us questions and we got some questions for you. Over to you, Teshin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mole, Sugar and Cyrus for having me. And uh, thank you everybody else for allowing me on your, on your platform. So as mentioned today, I'm going to talk about claiming uh, research and development tax relief uh, in 2021. I have to admit, I slightly changed uh, what I was going to talk about when I learned that there's quite a diverse audience here today. So obviously, if they're just companies or potential clients, that's one conversation. If there's accountants, it's another conversation. Uh, but we also have students. So I've had to change it so everyone can take a piece home with them today. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, one saying he's got no voice yes. video. Okay, I think for it's for me hand. Just keep going. I can hear okay. you. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. So, so there's a great introduction. I appreciate it. Um, in addition to uh, working in tax since 2008, uh, founding GrowthPad because of the disconnect you mentioned, uh, I'm also a family man, uh, father of three children, three young children, uh, a four-year-old, uh, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. So that keeps me busy. And I've got a lovely wife as well. So it's, my life is balanced between growth pad and, and the family. And even at growth pad, we have um, five of the people who I work with. So I've got a family at home and I've got a family at growth pad. So firstly, I think it's important to establish what is R&D tax relief. So this was introduced in the year 2000 to encourage companies to invest in, in themselves to improve productivity and output. So countries like Canada have, have had R&D tax relief since the 1970s. Uh, so to say that we've introduced it in 2000, we're quite new to it compared to everybody else. And the government's still ironing out details uh, to help it more be more efficient to claim, be easier to claim. At the moment, there's quite a few hurdles in claiming because first, the definition is quite, it's very confusing. Uh, you might think something will qualify, it doesn't uh, and vice versa. So the government are cu currently going through a process of simplifying uh, claiming this. So companies can even claim it themselves if they wish to. Now, r &D tax relief works through the corporation tax system and generally what it does is it reduces your company tax bill. In, in this talk, I'm going to talk through what is R&D tax relief, who qualifies, uh, what you need to meet to qualify, uh, and what sort of costs qualify. Uh, what I want you to take out of this is 
I want you to be able to be able to have a, a general discussion with someone about this. So if you're an accountant and you've got a client, I want you to be able to be able to talk about it with them to give them a basic understanding of r and tax relief. If you're a student, I want you to look at the comps that I've got later on in the slideshow and understand where, how you can claim it and where you put certain costs and what sort of costs do qualify. Now, it's quite hard uh, to deliver a talk like this through the computer. So it's really important for me and you to understand that you can, you can hear me, that's the first thing. And secondly, you understand what I'm saying. So I will have questions uh, throughout this. Uh, so there's more interaction. Right. So I want you to, to go to the chat box now. And I want you to tell me if your company or if your client's company, don't read the second bullet point, spends a hundred pound on stationery, how much can the company claim back as an expense? So if you write the answer in the chat box, uh, Sugar's not wasting any time here. Well, I hope they all agree. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the now. questions about making sure they're not all asleep or eating their dinner <laughs> behind the blank screens. <laughs> well, very well done to Sugar and Orville. That's exactly correct. It's a hundred pounds. Well, Alfred should we wake up wherever he is. <laughs> Alfred, where are you? I'm missing you. <laughs> No, still no reply. He's having yeah. his dinner. <laughs> Imagine spending a hundred pound, but getting two hundred pound as an expense. That's what R and D tax can do for your business and for your client's business. So, why would the government want to give this additional expense? Well, the first thing they got to tick is the UK's productivity. Um, if you compare the UK to other European countries, our productivity uh, to our GDP is not as high as them. Uh, so that looks bad on the government. So they need that number to go up. Secondly, let's say the company give X amount of money back to a client. Um, and that client then reinvests into the company, hiring new staff, new employees, new salespeople for new product, new developers to create software and so forth. That increases the workforce of the UK. When that workforce in increases, they have tax to pay on their salary. So the UK government get a net input of tax collection. So let's say, for example, they give a company one pound of tax for R&D tax purposes. They want to get back two pound or three pound back in other taxes. And this is what R&D helps them to do as well. So in effect, everybody's winning. So who can claim R&D tax relief? So a company or a business, sorry, it, there must be three conditions that it must meet. Firstly, it must be a qualifying business. Secondly, the project itself must qualify. And then there must be some qualifying costs of that project. And we'll go through these details in turn to give you a better understanding. Now, a qualifying business must be a going concern. Now, I think you, you, the audience, will know what a going concern is better than what I would, to be honest, because you're all accountants and it's an accounting term. Uh, generally, it, in my opinion, it means a, a company is going to go uh, continue trading for foreseeable future. Uh, and it's not in administration or in any financial difficulties. So that's the first condition. The second condition the business must meet, uh, it must be subject to corporation tax. It is a sense, R&D tax is a, a corporation tax relief. So the, the, the claimant must be within the corporation tax system. So this includes PLCs, LTDs, and uh, also uh, CICs. So once the business ticks that box, it must tick the next box, which is the project itself must qualify. Of the three qualifying criteria, I think this is the most difficult. So um, if you have any questions, please, please. 
uh, feel free to ask. Um, I've got a question here from Sugar. Um, how long have uh, the relief been available from HMRC? It was introduced in the year 2000. Uh, we are quite new to other, other companies. So let's go through what is a qualifying project. Well, firstly, the, the business must aim or achieve an advance in science or tech. Second is the most important, in my opinion, the, the company must overcome uh, technological or scientific uncertainties. And the third is the actual work itself must not be readily deducible by a competent professional. So I'll go into detail what this, what this means. Um, I have a question sure. that, that goes to the previous slide. You're saying that it must be a going concern uh, um, and, and does that mean it has to be in profit because it might be in loss or we still consider it to be a going concern? No, it doesn't have to be in profit. So for example, I've got a startup company that I'm actually working on at the moment and they have a total loss of about 4 million. Uh, and they're still claiming it's because they got funding. So there's a foreseeable future, they're still a going concern. Okay, all right, good. So I want you to put in the chat box, what do you think of, or which companies do you think of uh, when I mention um, R&D? Come on everyone, don't be shy. Google, yep, IT companies. Research companies, correct, correct. Tech companies, thank you, Alfred. Manufacturing, perfect, yep, definitely. So typically what I get is, I get these companies uh, that people say they, they think will qualify, Tesla, Apple, some sort of scientific company, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix. And it's right, these companies will be undertaking projects that qualify for R&D tax relief. But the definition is more wide. The definition of R&D is very wide. So companies you probably don't expect that qualify, potentially could do. And I'll show you why now. So I mentioned before, the first part of the definition to qualify for R&D tax relief uh, the company must uh, aim or achieve an advance in science or tech. Now, this doesn't have to be blue sky innovation or groundbreaking like the companies we just mentioned previously, your Amazon, your Teslas. It includes companies that are making appreciable technological or scientific uncertainties to existing products, software, devices, service, machinery, it could be absolutely anything across any sector. R&D tax relief does not discriminate which sector you're in. As long as you tick the boxes of the definition, you will qualify. So for example, let's say a company is making a product and this product is either smaller, faster, more efficient, cheaper to manufacture. It makes less um, environmental wastage or it's easily recyclable. That would tick the box of being advancing in, in uh, science or technology. I'll give you an example here. So these two are both iPhones. Um, got iPhone 12 Pro Max, and we got iPhone 12. They both make telephone calls. They're both text. You can use WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram, Clubhouse, whatever you kids use these days, you can use them on, on both of the phones. But the iPhone 12 Pro Max has better recording device. The Zoom capabilities are better. It has LiDAR technology. The screen is better. Those underlying technologies would enable Apple to claim on those things. Another point is to expand on what an advance is. Uh, the best way is to give you an example. So Deluxe is an international massive paint manufacturer. And they let's say they create an all-in-one paint where you need one layer. Uh, and you don't have to put three different layers to, to paint a wall for example. Let's say a company in the north of England also want to create a similar paint. 
Now, Deluxe don't share with everyone, we made the paint like this. They don't give the, the details of the chemicals used or the manufacturing process or anything. So this company in the north of England has to do its own R&D to figure out how to create this product. That would also qualify. Uh, I've mentioned before that failed projects um, also do uh, qualify. Uh, at this point, do we have any questions? No? Okay, I'll continue. Okay, so this slide here is the most important slide in the whole presentation, but unfortunately, it's also the most dry. So I'll try to make it exciting by waving my hands or something, but you've got to bear with me and please uh, take this on board. So the project must be an advance in science or tech. The second bit is the, the project must, the company must be overcoming technological um, or scientific uncertainties. Now, what is uh, scientific or technological uncertainty? Well, these exist when the knowledge of doing something, whether it's known to be scientifically possible or technologically feasible is not available uh, in the market or it's not readily deducible. Or it could mean the knowledge of something of how to achieve in practice is not available or is not readily deducible. You're probably thinking, Tessin, what on earth are you talking about? And so I try to simplify this, this bit of the definition to help people understand better. So this is how I tell my clients. This uncertainty exists when there's not an established path to complete the project. So let's say, for example, you're standing at A and you want to get to Z. A is where you're starting from. Z is the finished project. You know what the project kind of will look like or the product will look like at Z, but you don't know the route to take from A to Z. You will face certain technological and scientific challenges in the process. You will be doing trial and error development. You might even fail at some stages. Those are all uh, key indicators of a technological or a scientific uncertainty. And this part of the definition is probably the easiest. Uh, the project uh, must not be ready deducible by a competent professional. So for example, if I, an accountant, try to create software, obviously I'm gonna find it difficult. <laughs> but if a software developer tries to create something and they find it difficult, it shows that a competent professional is finding this thing hard. So that would tick the box for the third part of the definition. So if a company meets these three parts, advancing science or technology, uh, the overcoming uh, technological or scientific uncertainties, and the project's not readily deducible by a content professional, the project will qualify. I just want to give you some real life examples, uh, just to give you an indicator of, of what sort of thing I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, and these are clients that we've worked with um, recently. So I mentioned pay quite a lot in this project, in this uh, presentation, sorry, because I recently dealt with it and it's sat front of mind. Um, so this company created uh, new paints to replace leaded paint uh, and a new paint system. So it's quicker to uh, paint a wall and leave it. Also, uh, they will try to create paints for trains in India uh, and the Indian government have strict regulations of the type of paint you can use. It can't release a certain amount of toxicity uh, it can't burn at a certain rate. So they had to create this paint to put onto these trains. Uh, they got back 40,000 uh, pound. I got a manufacturing firm and this firm on top of mind, they create fertilizer, they're based in Wales. Uh, they created an extension to the production line, which saved time of uh, cleaning, cleaning the tanks after they were used. Um, and they increased the speed and it was more safer to use this extension they created. They got back 60,000 pound. And finally, a software development company created um, uh, a platform to house 3D animations uh, and create a large complex database. And specifically the R&D was related to the scalability of the software. It prevented pi uh, piracy, it had good security and it enabled a quick download um, of, of videos. Uh, and they got back uh, 225,000 pound. So you can see how valuable this claim is, look how much money they're getting back. And 
even look, let's look at the paint company. They got back 40,000 pounds. That's two junior people they can hire. Or that's one um, experienced person they can hire at senior level. So the money. I have, I have a question. Sure. So first of all, I, I like the paint industry analogy because I for in a previous life, I was a CFO for a paint company. But yeah. anyway, not, that's fine. The, my question is, how is this policed? So if you were to say, um, I'm going to claim for the toxicity in this paint company, um, certainly the tax man would know what, what that was. And uh, I mean, th these are language I'm used to. So I'm a reasonable, knowledgeable person in that industry. How would they police whether this qualify for R&D or not? It's a very good question. So as part of making a claim for R&D tax relief, there's two aspects. There's a technical report and there's a financial report. In a technical report, you or we do for clients put in layman terms of what the development was and how it meets the criteria that I've mentioned. When, once that's submitted to HMRC, they are now starting to hire specialists this is something that's quite recent, to be honest. Only, it's only been starting over the last couple of years. Before, they used to just sign it off. Um, but it's becoming much more regulated because the, the relief is becoming, it's becoming more older, more established. So they're starting to invest money in it and also to prevent fraud. So they'll have someone in there who will understand the chemistry or I hope they have someone in there who understands the chemistry. They definitely have people in IT who work for them and in... Um, Scientists and, and biologists definitely uh, they work with them as well. So that's how they monitor it. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Fantastic. Just going to quickly check the chat. Okay. Right. So I've talked about what would qualify, and I think this is a good point of mentioning what wouldn't qualify. So anything that follows an established method or known process wouldn't qualify or if it doesn't meet the advance in science or tech so for example let's say a software company has created some beautiful software it looks beautiful and the user experience is great that front end development the way it looks the way it feels wouldn't qualify because there was no advance in science or tech the way it works behind the scenes would qualify, but the front end bit wouldn't qualify. Also, let's go into routine development. Let's say the engineer creates just a normal extension uh, of, a, of a production line just to make it longer so there's more space, but there's no scientific uncertainties there either. I know I mentioned before that uh, one of the clients did claim for uh, the production line development, but that it wasn't just an extension. It did different things. It, it made the process safer. It was made it faster. This I'm talking about something that's just added on. That wouldn't qualify either. Um, also, a standard process of development. So let's say, for example, someone's creating a WordPress, uh, create, using WordPress to create a website. That too wouldn't qualify because the knowledge of WordPress is available all over the internet. It's in forums and it's quite an established technology. So that wouldn't qualify either. Right, so at this point, I want some questions, please. Oh, I, I, I have questions, though. <laughs> I have questions. I, 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 it's, it's always going to be probably me, probably, but it doesn't matter. I'm, my question right off the bat was an IT company would have um, the normal run-of-the-mill software development, and then there would be bug fixes. And in, in, in keeping with what you're saying, what qualified and don't qualify, would a bug fix be a, a what's qualifying or not? Because it, it depends on what you mean by a bug fix. So I'm just thinking previously I've had, um, okay. So for example, when a, a software company creates a, a software platform, it might use tools to put into an ecosystem. Yeah. Maybe one tool is so new that it doesn't have established processes. So the people that create that tool might just update it overnight. Okay. And when they update it overnight, it has an impact on the tools it's connected with. Okay. Everything stops working. 
or doesn't work properly. That sort of thing would qualify. Um, a normal, what I call a tweak, that wouldn't qualify. It has to be, there has to be an advance in science or tech. Uh, Sugar's mentioned, oh, sorry, firstly, I've answered your question. Yes. Fantastic. Sugar's mentioned, how can CIC companies qualify for this? Exactly the same as uh, a company that's a limited company. They follow the same process. This, this, they, can charities undertake, if it's a CIC, if it's operating through a CIC, yes. So the main thing is it has to be subject to corporation tax. So it has to um, submit a CT600 uh, after the accounting year. I've got a question. Sure. What is the turnaround period for HMRC payout? Okay. So like all organization, it varies depending on how busy HMRC are. Mm -hmm. Since coronavirus um, has happened, they're trying to turn around payments within 28 days. What I generally find is outside of coronavirus time period, it's usually between four to six weeks. Okay. So it's, it's quite fast compared to other HMRC departments. Mm -hmm. uh, they are quite good. Uh, they do process things quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how far back can you go in terms we're of to, claims? We're going to cover that, but I'll mention it now. Oh, so see, okay. You can, you can claim uh, from two years of an end of an accounting period. And I'll give an example towards the end. Okay, which okay. thank you. Uh, what are the fundamental policies and strategies of the CIC companies? Question from uh, Idrissa. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, what you mean, um, to be honest, uh, with that question. Um, you want me to answer it? Yes, please. So a community interest company is um, something similar to a charity, but in this case, um, it's a, a normal limited company by shares or guarantee. It's not a charity. And in terms of principle, it just works like a normal organization. Thank you. So we've covered what sort of businesses qualify. We've covered uh, what's projects qualify. Now let's cover what costs qualify. So these are the only costs that you can claim for R&D tax relief. Staff cost, consumables, subcontractors, externally provided workers, which are referred to as EPWs because it's quite a mouthful, uh, software and volunteers for clinical trials. So software costs would include gross salaries, company paid pension contributions and company paid NIC. Uh, consumables would be materials used and transformed in the R&D. So I go back to paint. Let's say this company- Sometimes you get injured. Hello, Idrissa, we got, we got a question? No. Uh, Sugar has asked, uh, do all the COVID-19 clinical trials qualify for this relief? Um, probably. That's... I knew somebody had to make money out of it. <laughs> Prob probably. Uh, it's not the CICs my... and the charities, not for profit sector. <laughs> this is how the world works, unfortunately. It just seems the government is pushing tax reliefs and tax incentives to these big companies. And yeah, the examples and it, that you gave with Amazon, with uh, Apple, with, you know, it, it's like looking after your friends. It is, but um, I'll go on to why this is slightly different uh, in a short while. Um, but yeah, I, I think that these companies will be able to claim on the volunteers for the clinical trials. Uh, so I was at consumables. Yeah, so going back to the example of paint, Paint company purchased all these, all these chemicals and materials and it creates a paint, they would qualify. And also they can claim a portion of their utilities. Um, subcontractors, so let's say this paint company creates the paint and then it subcontracts the testing. So, you know, I mentioned before where uh, one of my clients, they created this paint for this 
trains in India and they had to test whether they meet certain regulations. That regulatory testing can be done anywhere in the world. Uh, so that's a subcontractor. An EPW is essentially an agency worker. I could go into an hour's talk just on subcontractors and EPWs, uh, but I'll leave it basic for this talk. Um, what I will add though, is if the claimant company and the subcontractor or EPW are not connected, so they don't share the same group structure or the same shareholders, then you have to cap the cost at 65%. So for example, if an unconnected claimant company and subcontractor uh, doing work together and the claimant company pays a subcontractor 100,000 pound, they can only claim 65,000 pound of that money in their claim. Uh, software costs can be claimed. So for software development companies, that's it's quite obvious, but also let's say an engineering company uses CAD software, a portion of that can be used as well. And as we touched with the chat with Sugar before, uh, clinical trials. So any volunteers that uh, get paid for clinical trials, uh, they'll get paid for that and that can be claimed as well. I'll be honest, I have never ever included that cost in any of my claims. That's for the pharmaceutical companies and most of them will be, um, their work will be handled with probably the big four. So that's why I've never come across it, across it before. What I want to add also is, and I think the best way to, is to give an example. Let's say we've got Mr. Smith. Uh, he's an employee and he's on, let's use easy numbers, a hundred thousand pound a year. And he spent 50% of the year on this project, you would only claim 50% of his salary. So you'd only claim 50,000 pound of his 100,000 pound salary. Right. This is an example that I want you to do now. If you've got paper, uh, I want you to uh, write down what you think the, the qualifying R&D costs are. Also, the, the staff names here, these are linked to something. If someone can tell me what these staff names are linked to, they get a bonus point and a shout out um, on this presentation. Um, so let's, John Kimball is on 100,000 pound. He spends 30% on R&D. Jack Slater, uh, his salary is 80,000 pound. He spends 45% on R&D. Uh, Mr. Freeze, 65% uh, sorry, 65,000 pound salary, 80% uh, R&D, and same with Dutch, and the same with uh, Conan, who's probably uh, a part-time employee. Uh, this company also uh, has paid uh, 10,000 pound in consumables. Uh, they've got a bit jazzy and they've purchased a MacBook Pro for just under 1,700 pounds, and they have paid a subcontractor 16,000 pound to do testing. So I'm gonna give you two minutes now just to process this in your mind, or, get writing the answer down and I'll go through it in a second. In the meantime, I will look at this question that's come from Sugar. Uh, UK company paying corporation tax, can they claim R&D work in other countries like Africa and Pakistan? It depends. So most likely that work will be outsourced to a subcontractor or an agency. Uh, so in that, in that relationship, the claiming company can claim the money but in most circumstances, it'd be capped at 65%. Has no, one, has no one linked these names to anybody yet? Is it just me? Don't Google it, that's cheating. I'm really surprised about that. Um, I'll just give you half a minute extra now I'll uh, I'll run through it right let's uh, run through this so John Kimball, 100,000 pound salary, 30% on R&D, that's 30,000 uh, pound. Jack Slater, uh, 80,000 pound salary, 
45 percent R&D, 36,000. Uh, Mr. Freeze, he has spent eight percent of his time on this project, and he has a salary of 65,000 pounds. So that's 52,000 pound of cost we can claim. Dutch, we can claim uh, seven and a half thousand pound, and Conan can claim 90, sorry, 9,000 pounds. So uh, that totals 134,500 pounds just on staff costs. Now we can also claim the consumables of 10,000 pound, but we can't claim the cost for the MacBook Pro because it's, it doesn't fall under any of the headings that I mentioned before of qualifying costs. It's not a staff costs. It's not a consumable. It's not used within the R&D. Um, it's not utilities. It's not uh, outsourced work for EPW or a subcontractor. And it's definitely not uh, paying volunteers for taking clinical trials. So that wouldn't quali qualify. The subcontractor costs, um, I've assumed here that the subcontractor and the claimant company is unconnected. So I've capped that 16,000 at 65%, which comes to 10,400. If you add all them together, this company has qualified R&D costs of 154,900 pounds. Did anyone get that right or sort of right? Or does anybody have any questions? On, but on, you said it was 200%, so I doubled it and get 309 points. Okay, you, you went a step further. You went to the next step. That's uh, fine. Okay, all right. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is where it might be useful for some of the students. So on the left, I've got a tax comp. Uh, which is before the inclusion of the R&D cost. So profit um, as per accounts is 148,000. We add back a depreciation of 85,000 and we've assumed a capital allowance of 14,160. Uh, the trade profit comes to 218,840 and as the corporation tax rate is 19%, it results in uh, a tax liability of 41,000. 580. Now, this cost after R&D costs, all the costs are the same apart from the R&D costs. Now, you can see the R&D cost here. I've got the 154,900, which we calculated before, but I've uplifted it by 130%. So that's the tax-free uplift that we refer to in R and D tax, oops, and that comes to two hundred one thousand three hundred and seventy. Um, some of you might be thinking, "Ah, Tessin, I thought you said it's two hundred and thirty percent, not one hundred and thirty. You got to remember this one hundred and forty eight thousand. These figures come from the accounts, so a hundred percent of the costs are already included in the accounts. Oh. We claim the additional one hundred and thirty percent. So the 100% plus the 130%, 230%. Got it. That can be quite difficult to explain sometimes. So I'm, I'm, glad, that you, I'm glad that you got it. But in, in this example here, we've come to a tax liability of 300, sorry, 3,319 pounds. And you can see that they've paid um, 154,900 on the R&D uh, and they've made a tax saving to compare these two comps of 38,261. So it's quite generous of the government to give the company this money to tax saving. And you can see how useful that is because that could hire a few apprentices. It could hire uh, maybe two junior staff or maybe one senior staff. If the mathematicians among you, if you divide this three, three, sorry. You get that. Let's pass that. So I've talked about R&D tax and there are actually two schemes. There's an SME scheme and there's a scheme that's known as research and development expenditure credit, which is generally for larger companies. The examples I've given so far relate to SMEs because that's what I encounter the most most of the RDEC claims or companies that fall into RDEC are done by the larger big four companies. And I don't usually see that amongst um, clients of my size. 
Excuse me. <coughs> um, I have a question. Sure. To the previous one. Sorry. The previous slide. Yeah. It, it don't have to, you don't have to go back to the slide. I wanted to point something out uh, from sure. a technical point. It was that sometimes these R&D costs may not be revenue costs. Yep. Therefore, they're not part of the deduction of profit already. Yep. I just want to throw that there for more lie and so on to just think. Okay. About. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember how we treat that. So it's, it would be intangible um, asset. Yeah. So we can still include um, it as an R&D cost and we uplift it as normal. Okay. We've got to ensure that we've not included it as within any other tax relief. We treat it solely as a cost for tax purposes. Okay. All right. I, it was just technical I, and, and I wanted to just share. That's all right. Yeah, it's a... It, it's a question I ask my clients uh, when we when we meet them is is how is your uh, how are your costs treated and software companies generally uh, they like to put it as an intangible asset because it makes a balance sheet look better and they like they want to sell the company down the line it's just it looks better for them. Okay. All right. Thanks. Right. So we've covered. I'm just conscious of time as well. Uh, we've covered SMEs. Um, so a profit making SME generally recoups 24.7% of its costs through a tax saving. So the example we did before, that's what it turned out to be, additional costs. A loss-making company can uh, recoup up to 33.35%. So that's quite generous compared to the RDEC, the companies that fall into the RDEC scheme because they can only get relief of approximately 10.5%. So if they spend... 100K on a project, they'll only get 10 and a half thousand pound back. Another thing with companies that fall into the RDEC is subcontractor costs are not allowed unless the work is subcontracted to a qualifying body or an incorporated business, such as a, a sole trader or um, um, a, a partnership. So the question is now, testing what is an SME? So an SME has 500 or less employees and the either of turnover less than 100 million euros or gross assets less than 86 million euros. Now, someone's going to ask me, Tess, why is this in euros? Because this is a question I always get. Uh, and it's to do with um, something, it's to do with state aid. Uh, because we were in, in the European Union, they... They provided the rules across um, all the European countries of, of what an SME is because they don't want the UK to have an advantage over uh, France, for example, or Italy. They want an equal playing field. So uh, that's why it's in Euros. Now, please take this in because I'm going to ask a question now. So employees, 500 or less, uh, and turnover less than 100 million or gross assets less than 86 million. Okay, so my example here, a company has 800 employees, it has turnover of 60 million euros, and it has gross assets of 30 million euros. Is this company gonna fall within an SME or the RDEX scheme? Sugar, I'll come to your question in a sec. This wouldn't qualify. So, sorry, what's that, Sugar? Would this one not qualify because of the turnover limit? It would qualify, but it might... It, what I'm doing here is determining which scheme it falls into. Oh, okay, whether it's SME or the other one. Yes, yes. Okay. So... This is the test. I think it was SME. It's RDEC because there's more than 500 employees. Mm. So the best way to work this out is actually to write it down while you're doing it with the client because it gets really confusing. It took me quite a while to get hand, 
to get the handle off, to be honest. Um, it's, it's, it's the and and or that confuses people uh, at times. Okay. So we'll come to on this. We'll come to example two now. This might be a trick, so please be aware. Employees 300, turnover of 120 million euros, and gross assets of 60 million euros. Is this an SME or is this going to fall within the RDX scheme? It's 50 50. It's still SME. It's an SME. Yeah. It's still SME. Yeah, it's an SME because employees less than 500. So that's met. And then either of the next two conditions being met would tick the box. So turnovers look more than 100 million. So that bit doesn't, um, that bit's not ticked, but the gross assets are less than 65, um, 86 million euros. So in this case, this would be an SME. <clears throat> so I had a question from Sugar. Are consumables the running costs? Consumables is a fancy name for materials. Um, materials used. So manufacturing companies and companies that are creating some sort of product, chemical, paints, coating, uh, even housing, uh, they will use uh, materials to create it. It's called consumables because what HMRC say is the material that you purchase, it has to be consumed by the R&D. So it's unable to be used again. So essentially, once the R&D is done, that thing cannot be used again. So we love talking about paint. So let's continue talking about paint. If you put chemicals together to make some sort of paint solution, the chemicals we put in, we can't individually take them out again and re-bottle them. They've been transformed to something else. They've been used by the We assume you mean raw materials. Raw materials. In context. Exactly. Okay. And as I said, it's just in a term that people would get confused. And for me, consumables are running costs because you're not going to generate them again. Okay, and understood. Yeah. I think the, the disconnect here is because I've never worked in accountancy. Oh, okay. I'm not, not an accountant. Uh, I've <laughs> We're thinking worked, of our terms and I've, your terms. I've always worked HMRC in HMRC have different terms as well. <laughs> and it's their interpretation that we've got to think of when we're trying to unpick this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and there's also, in R&D, there's different places you can look for the rules. So you've got the HMRC guidance, uh, and then you have the guidance from the legislation, and then you have the guidance from the um, BEIS guide. So it can get really, really confusing. And now we're out of uh, EU and Brexit, will all the legislation change? And will we stop using euros and will we start talking about state aid? I think state aid might exist. It's a complete guess. Um, oh, okay. I, but they've not mentioned it. For the time being, this is how we're, we're running with the current rules. There's no changes. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure if they're allowed to change anything because of the agreements they currently have. Okay. I don't know. Uh, it's one of those things that we have to watch this space and see what exciting thing happens in, in the world of R&D tax relief. Uh, so when can companies make a claim? So when a company gets grant funding, that usually is before the R&D starts, but R&D tax relief works differently. You can only claim after the year end in which the R&D took place has passed. Uh, we put the figures in the, the CT600 and the, the, the tax computation when we're submitting those. Uh, so when I submit the, the tax claim, it's usually with the accounts and the corporation tax return and, uh, and, the, and the tax computation. Uh, Morley like asked the question before uh, of can we backdate the claim? And yes, we can. It's two years from the end of an accounting period. So if a company has a year end of 31st of December 2019, they can make a claim from the, essentially the 1st of December, 1st of January 2020, right up to the 31st of December, 2021. So it's two years from the end of the accounting period. Okay, right. <laughs> Being a student myself at one point, 
I understand that you may have switched off and thought, Tessin, what are you talking about? So I've put this slide in for you people. <laughs> this is like an easy way to identify whether uh, a project will qualify. You won't be able to write the project up, but you'll be able to identify whether you qualify or a client qualifies or whether an example in some sort of exam question you have will qualify. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this, but obviously you're about to get the slides afterwards and it's worth having a read through because um, sometimes my, my so I part with accountants, they might just have this one thing on, um, on back of uh, the brochure um, and they can just read it out to the client and they can find out straight whether the client qualifies or not and then they introduce, introduce them to me. So this slide's important for that. Okay. Right, as an overview, uh, what we talked about was how does a business qualify? Um, it must be a going concern and subject to corporation tax. How does a project qualify? Uh, it must be an advance in science or tech. They must uh, overcome technological or scientific uncertainties. And the work must be not readily deducible by competent professional. Uh, costs that qualify are salary, subcontractors, EPWs, uh, consumables, uh, software, and the, the clinical trials bit that I mentioned. Uh, there's two types of R&D tax relief. One is for SMEs, where they can recoup up to 33, um, almost a third of their costs. And the less generous scheme is under RDEC, where they claim back approximately 10.5% of their costs. Loss-making loss company, companies can also make a claim and a, a company can uh, make a claim within two years of, of this year end. Now, these are my contact details. So if you want to get in touch, here's my email address. There's my personal uh, mobile number. Uh, and here's my website, or here's our website. We're in the process of updating this. So at the moment, it doesn't look that, it's not that good looking, but we're hopefully going to launch a new website within the next two weeks. Also, I have a YouTube channel where I give out free information about R&D tax relief. I try to cover topics every week. So I will copy and paste my channel uh, for you to look at and if you're interested to su subscribe to. <coughs> the end of the presentation, I've got a question here. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this name from Buese. Uh, so all that we have to talk about here is, does it apply to African companies? So you have to be within the UK uh, corporation tax system to qualify. So you have to be under, uh, you have to submit a tax return in the UK. Uh, what I would watch out for, let's say if one of your clients does work for a UK company and they're the subcontractor, <coughs> tell the UK company, you may qualify for this. So it's worth looking into uh, and obviously, that would be a great relationship builder between the company in Africa and the claiming company in the UK. Uh, and if you're really on the ball, you can also uh, refer them to me and get a referral fee for your, for your hard work. Right. That is bang on eight o'clock. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm quite impressed with that. Um, has anybody got any more questions? Where can we get your books? Right, so my books, I didn't go into detail about them uh, because I sold the rights to them. So my books will be on the FL Memo website somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I got paid to write them. I don't get paid per sale. Um, so I don't promote them to be honest anymore. Um, and I stopped writing for them a few years ago because I now only specialize in R&D tax relief. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking is I might write a new, a new book and uh, for only tax relief, hopefully start it towards the end of this year. Uh, but I kind of need to hire someone to manage the practice while I'm while I'm doing that. But if you want the book, it's on the FL FL Memo um, website. And there's also other books as well. To be honest, that are quite good. Um, I've got this one from Clary Tax uh, by James Bowton. That's that's quite good as well. Um, and that's eighty pound. But that one. That won't tell you how to do a claim. It can just tells you about the rules, which would be quite easy to find because 
if people tell you how to do a claim, they can't make any money. So this, I have two questions really. One, one was the administration of this in the back end, and yeah. and it means how do we configure an accounting system to ca to kind of keep track of this data while it's going on? Yep. Yeah. Um, and any suggestions in that would be great. And then yeah. my final piece was um, I researched this before because it came across my desk and we f I found a software which was claiming to be able to enable accountants to, to do R&D claims. And I yep. wanted to find out how you feel about that. Okay, sure. Uh, so the first question was that easing the administration burden on, on the claimant company. So to know what to store and save, you first need to know whether your project qualifies. Okay. So what I recommend is introduce them to someone. I chat to them. Uh, I let them know whether their project qualifies. And if it does, then we can work out how to um, get the cost. So the staff costs, that's quite straightforward because it's straight from payroll. Uh, mm -hmm. But they can create separate, um, what do you call them, ledgers, where you yes. can, or fold, folders in zero, or where we use to, to store the other costs of consumables, um, subcontractor costs, EPWs, and so forth. What, what HMRC look at is they don't want to burden the claimant company too much. They don't ask for a detailed record of exactly where every penny's gone. <clears throat> so for example, I'm, I'm doing a claim for a, a, a company that manufactures uh, food for the fast food industry. Uh, and they've created like this new healthy version of a kebab mm -hmm. uh, and they've got um they don't track their all their spending on consumables so in that scenario what i've done is i have taken their total material costs and i've and i've claimed one and a half percent of that and i've justified that in the report why i've i've, I've claimed that okay. uh, and the second question was to do with with, with the companies that do, uh, that provide this software. Um, I've never used them before. Uh, all our um, reports are bespoke to the client. It's, it's still, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's don't use them. That's not what, not the type of okay. person I am. I don't know what it's going to be like within the next 12 months. So what HMRC have done in the last three or four months, they've hired an additional um, hundred officers to to just solely look at R and D tax claims because it's getting really really popular. I think twenty five thousand claimants last year put put a claim through, so there wasn't enough staff to monitor this, check this, open inquiries or checks. But what I say is, if a company is sending out templates. And it's the same or similar thing every time, similar wording. Then it's, I think it will flag up more checks. That's just my opinion. I could be, it could be total waffle. That's my opinion. Um, I think it depends on what you want. Um, if an accountant wants to use that, go for it. If they, if they want to use somebody, if they want someone else to just pick it up and deal with it, then that's what we do. If they want to be asking the questions, uh, understanding um what sort of thing qualifies then the software might be useful for them uh there's another question here we are still concerned in africa how can we get those books how continue does a class that just come into okay so those books are available online uh what i recommend is follow my youtube channel because i give the information out for free i also talk about how you apply that practically uh and it's in short snippets uh, and that might help you with lectures. If you have any topics that you want me to specifically cover, drop me an email and I'll record in the next batch of content. And if you're following me on, on YouTube, you'll, you'll get a notification when, when, that's, when that's out. How's that sound? Yes. Right, any more questions? That's cool. Fantastic. That's, that's me covered for R&D tax relief. I don't know if uh, Morale wants to um, come back on now or if that's done from my side.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tessin. Um, uh, what a great, you know, uh, subject to talk about um, for us accountants. I mean, for us, Moriko. I mean, as you were talking, I was going through the list of clients. Yeah, um, that go through the um, qualification. Yes, how do you qualify? Yeah, business must qualify. Project must qualify. Yes, and the cost must qualify. And I'm running through my my head, you know, knowing those figures. Yes, and particularly where those figures have come from. And I think, you know, um, this is where we trusted accountants, you know, are really, you know, asked to ask ourselves a question. You know, uh, are we really, you know, in there for the clients? Yes, because I'm looking at where I sit at the moment. I can see some clients, you know, uh, really, yeah, we should be looking at this. Yes, a little bit more, yeah, to pass that on to client. Um, so, you know, I'm so grateful, you know, to have you on here. Yeah, so we need to uh, probably have another session for us to have a conversation, you know, how we take this forward. Yep. Yep. Um, but definitely this is an area that um, for us we've been, I don't know when the last time I talked about R&D. Okay, I've got some guys who are looking at it. Yes, but um, I think the way you have presented it, you've made it look so straightforward. Yeah. And we are more about simplicity. Yeah. How do you make things simple? Yeah. So I, I, too like, I too like living a nice, simple life. I don't want a headache yeah. when I go yeah. to bed. Uh, when yeah. I, to bed, I just want to pray to God and just go to sleep and I don't want to worry about my clients yeah. not being serviced or anything like that uh, yeah. and, and you met you touched on something really important actually which is serving the, the client yeah um, I've worked solely in tax and I've worked in R&D and there is a difference and I mm -hmm. totally understand why accountants will not catch on why their clients qualify for R&D tax relief because mm -hmm. it's different from other accounting and tax work I would yeah. say my work is 30% tax and 70% understanding technical things that they, the, the, the companies have done. And that's mm -hmm. only because I've got like a science background. I did, I did neuroscience and AI at uni before I, I, mm -hmm. I tax. So my brain works. I, that's why I picked this up really quickly. So I would say definitely, if you've got any questions, um, just drop me a line. I think we should okay. have a further chat and I'm happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, what is for us, we uh, always talk about this, you know, uh, we serve our clients and um, and we should be serving our clients with our reservation. And this is one of the tests, yes, where, you know, you look at you and say, well, hold on, are you really in your serving your client? Yeah, when you are not actually, you know, looking into, you know, reliefs like this, taking that into consideration. Uh, you just bog down on just the standard stuff, recording, you know, doing your account filing, city 600, and that's it. Here's my check, here's my invoice, pay me, I'm off. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, uh, but also the simplicity. Yes, um, so we're going to look into that as a farm, but also, you know, uh, try to begin to, uh, to include that as part of our uh, agenda item to be talking to clients about it. But also, we need to be able to now get, you know, because we've got six stages, you know, how the, the, our, our formula works, yeah? So at the recording stage, we need to be able to get people to understand this, yeah? And this is one of the stuff, because at that early stage, we don't consider, we don't know enough, yeah, to be able to really, you know, um, uh, capture that data, yes? Uh, so people are posting things all over the place, so at the end of the day, when you're looking at the account to the tax, yeah, the data that you see in front of you is not detailed enough. Yeah. Uh, so you miss out quite a lot of opportunities. So thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, and um, well, time is far spent, 10 past eight. And uh, thank you very much to all of you here. I'm sure you guys would uh, join me in thanking uh, Tessin for tonight. Uh, for this fantastic, you know, uh, source of information. I've just logged into your YouTube and I can see, you know, uh, and the good yeah. news is you're smiling. You see, that's the thing, you're smiling <laughs> in all of those yeah. videos. Yeah. It's really brilliant. It's really brilliant. It's really brilliant. <laughs> you know, so, yes, we're going to test it. We're going to look after it. You know, we're going to make sure we share it. Yes. Yeah. And um, thank you very much.
So uh, thank you very much, guys. You know, uh, this is a good, a good team here. Yeah, you know, still all over the place. You know, I'm, I can see uh, some new, new faces, new names oh, joining yes. us all the time. Yes, thank you very much for taking the time out to join us, and uh, look thank forward you. to seeing you all next, next uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Next. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you too. God bless all. Yes. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Bye. Yeah, when you bye. Pray, thank you for your expert work this week. Click on our YouTube channel where you can have full access. We upload a video every Thursday at 10 a.m. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And click on the notification bell to get notified for future videos. Mm -hmm.